This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome to episode 192 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Today's topic is about travel in dangerous places. Now I kind of want to say quote unquote dangerous places because, well, because we'll talk about this a lot during the episode and perhaps dangerous places is totally not the right way to describe nearly anywhere, Uh, but uh, we'll get to that. And I think you know what I mean when I talk about travel in dangerous places, Um as for my own experience of this, I guess when I was traveling in my twenties, I didn't really, I didn't really think this through too hard. And it was kind of more by chance than planning that I didn't end up going anywhere that you might label as dangerous. Um, but I certainly sometimes got into some dangerous situations, times when I was thinking, um, hmm, don't know if I'm going to get out of here. Uh, but I always remember in those situations, I was young and, uh, and childless, which is important, I think. Um, oh, well, if I die now, at least I'm out here traveling and I'm doing something I love right now. That's kind of how I felt at the time. But uh, I mentioned childless because I think that's when my feelings about um, dangerous kinds of travel changed. Because these days, well, very often I'm traveling with a child in tow, and that makes me much more conservative about my choice of destination. Um, I pay much more attention to government warnings and I, I kind of feel a, a much greater weight of responsibility. And even if I'm traveling without my son, I feel that weight. I don't want, I don't want something to happen to me and leave him motherless. Um, just because I was traveling and, and taking unnecessary risk. But I don't know if that's the right way to think. And I certainly know that some of that weight of responsibility isn't just even my own personal way that's thinking about what other people would say or feel if something happened uh, while we were traveling. So yeah, there's a lot to think about, but um, these guests today have given me lots of food for thought. And especially my first guest, uh, Tracy Croak, who I think is really spot on with how she describes uh, how we should approach considering a trip to a place that we might be unsure about, that people might say, don't go there, it's dangerous. So Trace has been to places that I would have struck off my list without a second thought, like Afghanistan. But she really made me really think twice about it by telling me this theory of hers of how we should consider this kind of travel. Well, I call it um, this pie chart of reality because uh, some of the places that I go to are quite challenging in terms of people's perception of them. Um, and because of that, I get asked a lot of questions. And these questions are usually around security and fear um, and perceptions. And when you think about it, like everybody is scared of somewhere. I mean, if you if you've got you know if you're really scared of spiders, you're going to be you're going to be scared of coming to Australia. Um, <laughs> so this this pie chart is how I um, look at information when I'm traveling to a place. Now, when we look at um, when when we think about any country about we think we're traveling to, um, if you imagine a pie chart now in your mind probably like 95%, the great majority of that of that pie is going to be stuff that you've got from the news, from, you know, films, you know, from Google. And um, to bear in mind that that stuff, you know, news isn't news unless it's exceptional or it's bizarre or it's sensational. Um, and even though there might be truth, it's, it's, it's exceptional generally. And then the other sort of I'm going to say you know four point something percent so now we're only left with a little little sliver left the other four point something percent is possibly you've built a bit of a picture from somebody who's already been there Mm -hmm. now this can also be um a story you know a good story but when we when we come back with our stories and travel like I'm you know we're talking about now they're always going to be the highlights or the crazy bits or the you know, even the, the the bad bits or the scary bits. And, you know, again, this is a sort of condensed view. And obviously when you're talking to somebody that's um, been somewhere, 
they can often say like, you know, well, I, 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 I went, you know, these stories are relayed from friends. They get relayed from friends. And it's just, it's a travel story. It's an experience of somewhere they went to a spot of that country they went to. So often, you know, they get sort of a bit of attached to and embellished a bit. And, uh, you know, I, yeah. I was talking to somebody about going to the Borneo and um, I'd been to Borneo. And this person jumped in and said, oh, yeah, my friend went there, you know, um, an insect crawled in his eye and went into his brain and his head exploded. Now, that well, oh. that's obviously a gross exaggeration, but it yes. may have been that because, you know, he was straight to this horrible thing that happened to a friend of a friend of a friend. Yeah. So that's the other 4.5%. Now, the tiny, you know, 0.5% is actually you may have had a conversation with somebody who has either lived there or worked there for a period of time or still lives there. And also in that 0.5% is places of credible and uh, research um, about a country. So statistics, you know, accurate, credible statistics. Now, now I've told you all that, I want your listeners to tip that chart on its head and take the 0.5% and apply that to the 95%. Mm. And the other 5%, say the other 4.5% stays the same. But generally, that's the reality when you get to any country. And that's how I started applying my research to countries um, Mm. that I was traveling to. Mm -hmm. And now, after you've done that, then obviously it's about how much weight you add to those things because we've all got different risk levels and you know, experience and what have you. So, but what you start with is the reality and then you decide from that. So 95% of your research should be from someone who has lived in the country or is still living there or has spent a vast amount of time, you know, working there. And I get my information from people who worked in charitable organizations, you know, we have a wide view of that company, not somebody that's parachuted into a uh, some sort of spot that's been created yeah. if you like for for um tourism maybe but mm-hmm. you know um so so yeah once you've got that reality then you can apply um what what i think is your own judgment of what you're prepared to um travel with mm-hmm. you know the risk you're prepared to travel with because there's risk everywhere you know oh, life yes. is inherently risky there's risks from about. staying at home yeah, exactly. And then you'll have at least a better perception because otherwise our perceptions are always, I think, going to another country um, quite, if you if you go back to the first one I'd explain, which is mainly how we think about things. It's not our fault. It's just the way information is fed to us. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go back to that one, you can see that that can be quite an unbalanced uh, view of a country to start with. And I've never been to a country, um, sorry, I've been, you know, what travel's taught me is that I'm pretty much wrong about everywhere and I'm somebody that tries to check myself a lot. So, That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the fear of going to, especially some of the places you've been where a lot of people would have a lot of fears about them, but most of it is yeah. completely from unknown and exactly like your original 95% of just random stuff that you've seen on the news or in movies or heard people talk about who really don't know. That's so true. That's exactly what we mostly think about. You know, I'm thinking of, for example, I know you're going to talk about Afghanistan. And Mm. I think most people would immediately say, oh, that's too dangerous. You can't go there. But it's exactly from that that 95% of information that really you should discount, basically. So... Yeah. Yeah. So smart. Or add, add a different weight to it. That's, yes. That's the point. Yes. You know, at least weight becomes, it very differently. Yeah. That becomes yeah. the zero point five percent of the reality when you get there. Because again, I can apply this statement to every country. What I find about uh, diff, different countries have got different problems, and you know it, it depends on stability and a lot of things. Um, but the one thing that I can apply to every journey I've ever taken. Um, anywhere and that's to uh, countries that a lot of people would go to is that the majority of people um, are decent and kind are happy to have you there and just want to help you I find personally that risks and scams and all these things they happen in the hot spots the tourism yeah. popular spots because they've got you know rich pickings to go yeah, exactly when that's you get right. outside that and you don't have to go very far outside you, you become more normal life, more everyday people. And, you know, that's the type of place I like to travel. And sometimes you don't have to travel that far 
out of a place to, to, to find that just regular life. I went on to ask Tracy about whether she'd actually ever decided against going somewhere after carrying out this kind of research. And you're probably not surprised to hear that she said, nope. Um, you know, she's never had a trip that she started any consideration about and then decided not to go because of any danger. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, she said that, you know, there would be some decisions that you would make differently or place, you know, parts of a place you would avoid. Um, after getting, you know, good, solid information about it. But um, it's never turned her off a particular place that she's had a, you know, an inkling of a plan to go to. So I really, really like this whole uh, pie chart of reality idea. And I'm going to really be applying this thinking uh, for lots of future decisions, I think. Perhaps even beyond just traveling, Trace, you uh, really got me thinking. All right, my next guest today is Michael Bartichel from the Today Dreamer podcast. And we were actually chatting about fears of travel in general, lots of different kinds of fears. But then we got on to this um, more particular topic of traveling to places that we hear might be dangerous. I feel like you, the fear is almost worse than the actual whatever you're scared of itself. That's that's kind of like right, a cliche, but it's so true. true. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a cliche for a reason. Exactly. So like, I guess another one, I just thought of one more, and this is probably a big one. It's, it's the fear of going somewhere that, that, you know, you hear is dangerous mm. or, or that you're worried about, you know, getting robbed or, or stabbed or shot or whatever. And I feel as though, um, that, that kind of fear, um, is, a, is it, again, another signal to be extra careful and to do things in a way that's, I guess, smart and but it shouldn't stop you going there and experiencing the culture and the place and the people and you know the sights the smells and, and the rest of it it should only be a signal i believe like because if you really want to go somewhere uh you shouldn't let what you know other people's opinions or other people have you know everyone has their own individual experience and a lot of time these fears come from stories which you should again pay attention to but i, I find like if you like, I was really worried on my trip because I do a lot of filming, and I was worried that wherever I'm going to go, my stuff's going to get stolen, and you know, I'm going to get I'm going to get beaten up because I'm carrying around a camera, and I'm going to kind of get into a lot of trouble. But I found that if I speak to, you can really limit the chances of that happening. If you speak to locals when you're there, you kind of uh, speak to hostels and find out you know where to go, where not to go. Even if you're not staying in a hostel, you can still do that. And just kind of read up online through through like forums and blogs and things like that about the things to be careful of. You can usually kind of avoid any sticky situations. And even if you do get into them, if you've got insurance, it, it kind of helps you out. Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, we're often fearful of things that have a very, very, very tiny chance of happening. And even if they happen nearly all the time, things turn out okay and you end up with a great story to tell. You know, the, the chances of something actually going badly wrong are very, very, very slim. And I always think often, you know, pretty much the same as of something going wrong while you're back home. So, yeah, I think. Uh, but, you know, it's still hard. It's easy to stay in our comfort zone at home and much harder to step out of it. Um, I was just wondering, can you think of a, of a, um, a perhaps a specific example of a destination you were particularly worried about or had some, you know, special that you that you maybe were concerned was dangerous? Yeah, there's a, there's a place actually someone emailed me about recently and it's called Cali and it's in Colombia and it's, it's where it's kind of like the, the birthplace of salsa. So, um, even though salsa didn't come from there, they've got actually their own version, the Colombian salsa, I guess, from Cali and it's the way they dance and it's just the whole, the whole place, you know, the taxi drivers are playing it in the, in, in the cars and, <laughs> and there's people dancing on the street. There's salsa techs every night and there's a studio to dance and learn to dance in everywhere so it's it's really in the life and the blood of the place and i i really wanted to go there for that reason but i heard that it was very sketchy and there were so many stories about people getting robbed and you know running away from people that had put guns on them and, mm. and all that kind of thing but i went anyways and i kind of um made sure i was in a group while i was there and i had it was probably one of my most rewarding experiences I, I was doing salsa classes during the day and then every night i would go out and practice the moves i'd learned the previous day and i did that for about four weeks and i got like really good at dancing cool um and i paid for the classes uh with video work so i created videos for the studio so i didn't have to pay for them and it was just like an amazing experience a lot of friends a lot of 
dancing and, and kind of a crazy time. So <laughs> it, and if I hadn't have gone, if I hadn't have pushed past that, um, I really, I really, I wouldn't have realized it, but I definitely would have lost something, you know. Michael's example of his experiences in Kali, I think, are exactly right. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing Tracy was talking about. We hear all those stories and all the danger, danger, but really that's the the 95% of stuff that we hear but we shouldn't be listening to, and uh, that's a perfect example. Now, my final guest today is Ferenc Elikas from Budapest, and he is no stranger to doing things that we might consider uh, to be dangerous. Uh, most recently, he and his girlfriend drove from Budapest to Singapore. And of course, there's all sorts of uh, interesting places along the way. Uh, but today's story is about a different drive that he attempted um, a few years back and really exemplifies exactly what we've been talking about so far in this episode. Back in 2014, I actually attempted to drive from London to Mongolia with two friends of mine from New Zealand. Uh, they also lived in London and with two Kiwi friends, we tried to f- drive from, we bought a, a, a like a pickup truck on eBay and then we <laughs> tried to drive from London to Mongolia and we were in Tajikistan and we, uh, and it was like, according to our maps, we were close to about like 10, 20 kilometers from Afghanistan. Mm. And it was about 10 o'clock in the evening at night. It was pitch black and we were, we were lost a little bit. We were lost. So we left the village and then we ended up on this dirt track. And in Tajikistan, sometimes you have good roads. Sometimes you have mediocre roads and sometimes you have terrible roads or no roads. It's all just like a dirt track. And we, we definitely were lost and we knew that, but <laughs> we went, uh, like we went past another car. It was like an uphill little track going up to the mountains. I don't know why we ended up there. We were, our goal was to get to the the Pamir Pamir Highway. There's this among overlanders. Anybody driving through Central Asia wants to do the Pamir Highway. It's just incredible, and or cyclers as well. So it's not not necessarily uh, only people who drive. Uh, a lot of people cycle through the whole world. It's incredible. Uh, but uh, so we were on this little dirt track, and there was a road. There was a, a car parked by the road. This, on this track and somebody tried to stop us and and we saw that there's this guy who probably has some kind of trouble and there was somebody else sitting in the car as well and we thought and uh, one of my friends were driving and both of us who were not driving we were telling him don't stop don't stop just go we don't know where we are we are close to Afghanistan it's pitch black just just let's just go mm-hmm. 100 meters literally 100 meters later we broke down oh, no. completely like uh the, the engine stopped and everything. And we're like, okay, that's, that's not good. And cut long story short, this guy that we, we didn't help had a flat tire and his family with the small kid was in the car and we didn't help him. He ended up helping us because he then, uh, so we then obviously we had to, we were there. We helped him with the flat tire. He could then go back to the village, get his mates come back up at 11 in the evening oh. and and fixed our car a little bit so that we could roll back to the village. And the next day, his friends fixed our car and we could continue with our trip. Oh, wow. So it was it was like a, we, we would have deserved a, a situation when nobody helps us because we didn't help this poor lo- local guy yeah. because we were scared, because we were ignorant. I don't know what we were, but... Uh, they ended up helping us and we didn't want to help them in the first place. But yeah, it was a unique situation. I mean, it was at night close to Afghanistan and you read stuff. And Oh, absolutely. You know, I think I, I don't judge you at all for not stopping. I think that probably is a sensible <laughs> thing because, yeah, you really yeah. don't know. But, um, but isn't that just uh, like a life lesson just slapping us in the face like that, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I would yeah, have done yeah, the exactly. same, but... You know, I hear so often and in my own experience as well, as well, that when we travel, you know, we always have this stranger danger idea, but actually 99.999% of the people that you meet are actually going to help you. And that's just such a good example yeah, of it. Exactly. Exactly. So they helped us and we, not only they fixed our car, we actually spent the night at his family's place oh. in the, in the nice room. They all in this area, they all have their whole house and then they have one nice room to show, you know, and we spend the night in that room and they fed us 
they fixed our car. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it was just, uh, <laughs> but it was such a, a karma thing that we broke down 100 meters later. I love this story. Just another of those examples that my guests keep teaching me about that most people, nearly everybody in the world is good and will help you. Uh, and uh, it's also exactly what Tracy was saying, that uh, the further away you get from the tourist hotspots, you know, kind of the safer it is. And this sounded like a long way from uh, the tourist hotspots where there might be some scam artists around or, you know, some element of danger. But out here, uh, you know, in Tajikistan, close to the Afghan border, there was only this incredibly lovely helpful family who gave up so much to help them, even though Ferenc and his friends had initially driven by. So, uh, yeah, a really telling and really wonderful story. All right. So I hope that this episode has given you some food for thought and that like me, if you are at any stage considering uh, a trip to somewhere that you might be, you know, someone might say you say to you, oh, well, that's dangerous or you might even think that yourself, then think twice and go back to Tracy's idea and her uh, pie chart of reality and see if you can turn that thinking on its head. This is certainly not to say just wildly go anywhere without thought. Absolutely not. But uh, uh, definitely take away some of those preconceptions and, and ideas that you might have that uh, you know, might be sensationalized or at least deserve, you know, some more deeper thought. So I love uh, thinking about these things and it's definitely going to influence some of my decisions in the moment, in the future. And I guess in the moment too. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to episode 192 of the Thoughtful Travel podcast. Uh, don't forget you can support the podcast on Patreon. You get some bonus content and a few other benefits as well. And you can find out about that at notaballerina.com slash support. Um, and thank you very, very much to Denise, my newest, uh, wonderful supporter over there. Uh, thank you also, of course, to the fabulous guests that I had on today. First up, a huge thanks to Tracy Croak. You can find out more about Tracy's intrepid travels at her website, tracycroak.com. Also, big thanks to Michael from the Today Dreamer podcast and YouTube channel, and you can find him at todaydreamer.com. And a big thanks to Ferenc Elikas, and you can find out more about his travels at Overland Site, which is overlandsite.com. He has got a fabulous resource there if you are ever contemplating driving overland and, you know, exploring the world in, you know, on your own four wheels, I suppose. There's all sorts of uh, crazy stuff there and some really interesting adventures that he has already carried out. Uh, as always, come and chat with us in the Facebook group for Thoughtful Travellers. Just search for Thoughtful Travellers in Facebook and join us there. And the show notes for this episode, which will contain all of these links, of course, are at notaballerina.com slash 192. As always, a huge thank you for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now.